But I do have to say one more thing about writing about something I was involved in. Um, my, I had to make that crucial decision when, when, at one point along the way about whether I would refer to myself in the third person or as the first person. And my son said, how can you write about someone named Lori Bonai? And Lori did this and Lori did that. <laughs> it's like, you have to make that decision. It's a little weird. Um, I'm really glad the book's been really well received. You know, um, it's uh, gotten some good feedback. It's gotten a couple of recognitions from a couple of um, book awards. I just got one over the weekend from the West Coast branch of the American Historical Association, which was really special to me because they're, these are people, number one, they're historians and not lawyers, and number two, they don't know me, so it's not like they have like any invested reason to say something nice about the book, so that really actually meant a, a lot to me. Um, Seattle University School of Law, where I teach, is having their entire first year class read the book this fall as a vehicle for raising issues of race and lawyers' roles in addressing issues of race, um, which I think is really pretty nice and I've been doing a number, I'll be doing a bunch of book talks um, kind of up and down the, the coast. So I'm really glad and I was just mentioning, I get, you know, I get, I got an email this morning, I get emails from people who read the book across the country and just like, I just finished reading your book. Thank you so much for writing this book and it's, it's uh, extremely meaningful to me. Well, you know, you could actually refer to yourself as a third person. The modern trend of public figures and professional athletes is to Talk in the third person. <laughs> you know, Dale knows this. So <laughs> Dale would like to ask you this question. Was there any negative reaction to the book? Did someone say, why are you telling these old stories about this or that? Anything like that? You know, not yet. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> at least it's not being said. I think there's just a lot of negative energy being directed elsewhere. So I'm small potatoes, you know, compared to... The, the negative conversation that's going on. Has anybody tried to market this book or discuss this book in the um, uh, Muslim or Arab American communities? So, um, you know, uh, just like you, um, we've been getting, people on Fred's legal team have been getting lots of invitations to talk um, publicly about Fred, but in particular publicly on panels with members of the Muslim community and talking about the intersections between the Japanese American incarceration and um, and what's going on right now, the targeting of the Muslim community. And so a portion of it is because I wrote the book, but a portion of it is really just because we are um, seeing some really, really important connections being made between the Japanese American incarceration and what's happening to other communities, not only the Muslim American community, but immigrant communities. Um, black communities and, and all of that. And so, um, yes, I mean, I think we're all um, engaged in that conversation. Karen Cormox is certainly involved in that national conversation as well. I just noticed uh, my ex-partner Eugene Tomini and Sharon and Derek are here. Uh, Eugene was uh, one of my partners at the time we did the case and so helped support us to uh, bring this case and, you know, put food on our table. Anyway, so it's like old homes we hear, really. Yes. Derek is our board member, too. Derek's oh, on the board. Derek's on the board, too. I thought I saw him come in. <laughs> hey, um, so are you inspired to write any more books? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. So I'll say this took um, about eight years wow. um, to write. Not from start to finish. It didn't take me eight years to write. But, you know, it's kind of like you do, we, you do Christmas breaks and and summer breaks and, and, and all of that. And it was just such a really, really long, long um, process. I, I don't think so. And, and because I, I did this because I really wanted the story told, not because I see myself as a book writer. So actually, I think that there was a period of time where people, we would go around to speak, like they would go speak and all of us would go around and speak and people would say afterwards, someone should write a, a book. And I was thinking like, well, that would be really great. I think someone should write a book. And I'd be like every single thing, right? Like someone should write a book. Yeah, that's right, someone should write a book. And we're kind of looking around and kind of like, okay, you guys are trying to, someone's going to write a book. And then it kind of, unfortunately, uh, in academia, we have these things called sabbaticals. And so I was able to get a sabbatical and I kind of figured like, all right, Dale's not writing the book. Karen's not writing the book. <laughs> I'll sit down and write the book. And so it wasn't like this is something like I just like writing books. It was really just I, had, I think there was something um, that I think all of us wanted to say. And I wanted to take the opportunity to say it. 
So I'm going to ask Dale a question now. So Dale, as I said, goes around, um, all of us go around, and we do a lot of public speaking about Fred's case and about the Japanese American incarceration. And, um, and sometimes we joke about the fact that we did this in the 1980s and we're still out there traveling the country talking about the case. It's really pretty remarkable. Um, so I wanted to ask, why do you think there's such a, an interest in Fred's story? And, and, and I guess I'm, this is a leading question. You know, Fred's story resonates with okay. people. Why do you think it resonates with people? Um, well, the historical circumstances of Fred's incarceration, Japanese American incarceration, was a huge civil rights disaster. It was a tragedy in American history. And the redress movement did a great deal to publicize this and have uh, the government, you know, apologize, which it almost never does. So uh, the historical circumstances of what Fred did. Uh, excuse me, what happened to Japanese Americans was very significant. And having Fred stand up and challenge the greatest country in this world, the greatest power uh, at the time, in an act of courage, all of this sounds in American mythology, you know, the individual standing up against the unjust government. And I, I think the thing that adds to Fred's story is not just an individual like Fred or Gordon or men, they did the same thing, but Fred was... Uh, an everyday guy, Gordon Min. Gordon was a uh, law, became a professor. Uh, Min was a lawyer. Fred was a welder. And so, and we heard this when we first started the case. You know, well, Fred didn't do this for principled reasons. He did it because he was in love with his girlfriend. But Fred's reasoning, and you know, there's no doubt this is sincere because you know we know we knew Fred that he had such a sense of uh, justice that was so deep. It was very simple to him. For him, it wasn't about I know my rights, this is a constitutional right I have under the Fifth Amendment, like men would say, or Gordon saying that, you know, the rights to citizenship are going to be waived if I obey this unlawful act. Fred just said, this is wrong. I'm not going to do it. And so it was so deeply felt, profoundly held, and so held and so simply stated uh, that I think Fred, you know, when he would start telling his story, he would not go into these abstract or intellectual reasons for doing what he, what he did. Uh, and he would do it in his own, initially, very mumbly, bumbly kind of way. And he became very much more polished as he talked. Uh, but he became very endearing to people that they could relate to this man. This man who just said, this is wrong, I'm not going. And that was very powerful narrative, I think. And interestingly enough, when Fred first started, you know, he didn't want any publicity. And we promised him we would not do any publicity, Fred. Of course, we were lying, uh, <laughs> because we really desperately needed to do this for education reasons, right? Remember, we talked about that. And so we said, Fred, you know, can you just do this interview with this guy? And, um, and uh, it was a friendly Japanese-American reporter, and we made him ask softball questions. So Fred had a hard time, but he did it. Then we did another interview with Fred in a very, a very comfortable situation. And it started to escalate, and we get more and more people to interview Fred, newspapers, until one day we said, Fred, you know, uh, next week we have to do an interview with 60 Minutes. And uh, Ed Bradley came and uh, interviewed Fred. And by then, though, Fred started enjoying it. And he started understanding both his voice, or getting a voice, but also his mission, and his mission to educate. And because of the way he presented things, you know, in a very... Sometimes it was, it was a little bit embarrassing and Catherine, his wife, would say things like, one day he gave a talk, for example, at the Equal Justice Society. And he was talking about discrimination against Muslims, Arabs, and all. This was just wrong and, you know, this should not happen. But, but maybe those people should stop wearing turbans. And we thought, oh, no. Catherine goes, oh, no, slaps her forehead. You know, because they don't wear turbans, friends. Those are Sikhs. And... Um, and yet, then he would recover and say something absolutely brilliant. And so, you know, you, you kind of could accept the whole man because the, the, the core of him was about justice. So I think the personality, Fred's personality, um, was really helpful. The fact that our team here knew that our mission was education. So we, and, uh, we did as much as we could to get our voices out there to tell people the stories. And uh, Fred was very helpful to be able to tell a very uh, 
a compelling story. That's true. Yeah. So, shall we ask other questions, whether the audience has any? Sure. Yeah. I got a question. Sure. sure. What, where did uh, Fred get his, or, what was the origin of his sense of justice? Where, where did he get it from? I mean, how did it come about? The question too? Yeah. Where what did was Fred get his sense, the origin of his oh. sense of justice? Yeah. Somebody take that? That's yours. You know him. So, so, you know, obviously when one writes a book, one wants to explore, like, what was the story behind the man? Where did this come from? And, and I suppose the best way I can answer that is really just a matter that he, you know, he grew up quite literally learning about the Constitution, believing in the Constitution. He grew up all American. Um, you know, he was into tennis and he was into football and he was into Boy Scouts and, you know, very much, um, very much the American citizen that he was. And he took, and he said in his later years, he took, you know, we learned about the Constitution really seriously. Um, and he made a real commitment to this country and believed the commitment that the country was making to him. And so there was the same kind of sense of patriotism I think we see in so many in the Nisei um, community that didn't have the level of cynicism I think that um, was born when we were all growing up, you know, um, but really very much a sense of, of duty to country. You know, when the war broke out, he wanted to enlist and he was not able to enlist. And so he just had a very, very strong sense of being a citizen and being um, a patriot. The other piece, though, is that there was a piece of rebellion in him as well. I think that one piece that came out in the, um, as I talked to people, was that as the third son, you know, he wasn't the favorite son. His dad thought that he was, you know, or kind of came out maybe his dad was, and here's Karen who can even add to the conversation, um, who uh, thought he wasn't as successful. You know, he was kind of like a, a, a misfit within the family. Um, he was artistic. Catherine talked about how he was artistic and creative and um, less totally into running the family business and wanted to march to the beat of his own drummer. And so I think kind of looking at all those things, it's not at all um, surprising that he kind of went a different path. Yeah, but his decision to, do, to stand up wasn't popular within the Japanese community back then, too. Uh, right. They, so that he was, was isolated. In, in right. So, um, so uh, when he decided um, to resist the wartime orders, he stayed um, behind because he wanted to be with the woman he loved in the place that always was his home. Um, and he stayed behind when all the Japanese Americans were, were sent away. And when he went to camp, he learned that his family had um, been shamed by his arrest, his father um, really thought, like, how could you do such a thing? Um, there's a number of people that I spoke to who talked about how Fred was estranged in camp and treated like a criminal, um, uh, kind of a feeling that really broke his mother's um, heart to have this happen, and so he um, kind of went it alone, and, and you may certainly know the National JCL took a position against anyone who would resist the um, orders, calling them self-styled martyrs, um, and uh, so um, he very much was, um, he took the night shift um, working on digging for the hospital uh, because he wanted, he just didn't want to be around the people during the day, and here's Karen Korematsu, um, Fred's daughter, who made it here. So, I mean, I'll say something about that. Really you know, Fred, um, and Karen could probably tell you this, is a is, is, is slight man in a way, very thin, uh, very gentle, sweet guy, but he was really stubborn as hell. <laughs> and that was one of the reasons he challenged, and he was willing to go by his principles. Um, and we know this from from the time when he got a call from the president's office of the United States and said, do we want to award you the Presidential Medal of Freedom? So he called me and said, you know, they're not even going to pay for my air flight. <laughs> he said, well, can you mail it to me? And then he said, then he was pissed off. He said, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to get this without going to pay for my air flight. 
And I said, Fred, this is the highest civilian honor anybody could ever get. We'll find a way to get you. I mean, we, were looking, we, were, we didn't have a lot of money, so we were looking at uh, you know, getting frequent flyer miles, aggregating those up so Fred could go get the Presidential Medal of Peace. Well, Karen and was able to help with raising money, and we got a, a flight to D.C., and so he was able to accept it. So, you know, we saw his stubbornness when they offered him a pardon. He said, I don't want a pardon. We're going to pardon the government, if anything. So he had a very strong, uh, 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 stubborn streak, and so I think uh, he was he was a pariah in, in 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 camps. And you know, for the legal team, you know, we were told by the uh, publicly by the uh, former Supreme Court Justice Arthur Goldberg that what we were proceeding with in the Coram Novus actions was fruitless; that we would set back the redress movement if we lost the case. And so the stakes were pretty high. We felt that, you know, uh, well, we weren't going to lose. We, were, we had the wisdom of fools. So we were going to, you know, we are going full bore ahead. We had great evidence, but if we did lose, we would be pariahs in that community <laughs> too, you know. I don't think we dwelt on that very much. We didn't. Um, so let me say something else about um, Fred and the kind of controversy within the Japanese American community about his position. It's another reason I wrote the book, is I think that, um, you know, all three men, Fred Gordon and men, were amazing men of great courage. Um, but there was some talk in the community about how um, Gordon and men did it as an act, act of civil disobedience, whereas Fred did it because, for pers purely personal reasons, because he was in love. And I really felt it important, and I think all of us who know, who knew Fred, who know, who know his family, who saw him in this community, just, just that it was just so unfair to him, and so it was really important for to to write about not only who Fred was, to know that this was not a selfish person, but also that doing something so that you can be with a person you love in the place that's always been your home is your right. Mm -hmm. You know, he doesn't need to justify why he did this. And, and, and maybe this goes back to what Dale was saying earlier, maybe people can actually relate to staying behind because you're in love with somebody. I, I look at men and I just kind of think, could I do that? You know, like walk up and down the streets of Portland with a you know, copy of the curfew order in my hand, but I could see myself in Fred. I could see myself knowing somewhere in my gut, this is a wrong thing to do. Um, it doesn't mean I could have his, his courage that he ultimately had, but, but I think that um, Dale and I were talking about this earlier about one of the most challenging parts of the book to write was that part of the book in describing Fred's decision to stay, not because it was because it was hard to understand or anything, but I wanted so badly for people to understand it the way that, that, that I understood it, because I knew that people, um, there were some people in the community who really felt like, well, this was a selfish act. Um, and so um, I wanted to add that. Good, uh, that's a good point. Uh, any other questions we have out there? And then maybe we could get a comment from Karen. Yes, absolutely. Karen, could you uh, please come up and give us a half hour speech? <laughs> <laughs> no, we'd really like to hear your comments. Uh, just, you missed some of the first part, and we just pretty much talked all about you the whole time. But, right. <laughs> seriously, we are. Uh, I'm not, we're going to have to use a microphone. I wasn't, plan, I wasn't part of the plan program. Just say something. So, just something? Something. Yeah. <laughs> or you can go stand, it, maybe stand. Well, no. If you could stand up here, we have a camera. Oh. Oh, oh, no. Okay. Well, um, good morning. Or good, good, good morning. <laughs> um, thank you all for, um, for coming. Uh, so I'm wasn't kind of privy to all that you um, said previously, but uh, uh, <laughs> Roz is shaking her head. Talk about you, that's okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Roz. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we were, you know, we were pleased that, that first of all that, that Lori, um, you know, did write this book about um, about my father because uh, you know his his probably has been talked about really his perspective of the Japanese American incarceration was perceived by the community as being, you know, as we talked about, selfish. And, um, and, and it, 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 it really wasn't. It was, 
you know, is about being an American. Uh, and he did learn about the Constitution in high school. He, he was born in Oakland, California, and went to Castlemont High School in Oakland, and he was paying attention that day. So when I talk to kids, you know, I tell them, pay attention, because, you know, know your Constitution and your civil rights, because you never know where you're going to need them. Not like it did us a lot of good, or did them, you know, the, the, the niece say a lot of good at that time. But, um, but it, it was enough for him to say, you know, this isn't, this isn't right. And he just wanted to live his life as an American. What does it mean to be an American in this country? I mean, these conversations now are more relevant than even ever before. Um, and, uh, and so that's, you know, the good thing is that, you know, my father's book and what we're talking about today does bring focus to, to these issues. You know, the, the now that, and I think Frida talked about the, uh, um, the Frederick Cormatzer Institute uh, Earlier, and before I forget, I'm supposed to remind you, we have sign-up sheets over here, like your email, so we can, um, you, we can let you know about Fred Korematsu Day and our event coming up at the, um, at the end of, of January, probably over in the, in the East Bay this time. We kind of move it around. Uh, but, you know, next year is the a, is a 75th anniversary of Executive Order 9066, mass incarceration, right? So we're, we're going to be focusing on mass incarceration from the Japanese-American incarceration to mass incarceration now and how to, to break the, uh, the school-to-prison pipeline. You know, because we all need to, uh, you know, to work together to, to ad address the racial healing in this country um, if we're going to get to racial equity. And, and the Japanese-American story and, and, and our place in history is just as, as much a part of that. Uh, if we're ever going to change, you know, kind of the hearts and minds and, uh, of, 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 you know, this generation and future generations. So, you know, my, my father's book is, is, you know, certainly his, his story, but it also brings, you know, more to the understanding um, of the Japanese American incarceration, and that's what Lori wanted to do. Was you know you, you're telling that like for the institute, um, you know the teaching kits that we have, we partner with uh, with ninjas uh, in, in teacher development, but also to you know to start off with Fred Kormatsu as a springboard that launches the story. You know you, that's the story to launch all these other issues and and the lessons of history because obviously they haven't been learned and we need to you know not be the model minority out there anymore and just kind of you know put ourselves out there and be part of that narrative so um thank you very much <laughs> Karen, thanks so much i um i think it was wonderful how fred evolved into a, essentially an emissary for civil rights Korematsu became one of the sought-after speakers, and he stood up for the rights of Muslim and Arab Americans. And what I find really a nice legacy is to have another Korematsu continue that legacy, and that's Karen, who goes all around the country. She, she's on a plane as much as she's on the ground, but uh, she's been able to, to spread that message and make the connections between Arab and Muslims and, and you know, Black Lives Matter and other issues that are really important that are all related. So thank you very much, Karen. And if there are uh, we have any other questions? We have a question. Actually, I don't have a question, but I just want to let you know, I just came back from the OCA National Convention in Jersey City. And in next year, 2017, it's going to be in Sacramento. And they have uh, different tracks. And one is on education and history, so this is an opportunity to again uh, tell your story because there are so, so many chapters from all over the country, and Floyd Mori is very involved, so maybe that's a good no, time to start right. planning. Yeah. Well, so thank you. Say, that's, the second week so, in July. that's a really good idea. Yeah. Any other comments, questions? Otherwise, you can, there are refreshments. Rod, do you want to close this out for us? I had some one good uh, quick, quick question. Is that it? Um, um, let's see, what was it? <laughs> um, Fred and some of those, I think it's in the book probably, but um, Fred and the connection to, oh, he, I heard he was in, quickly and uh, in turn 
or jailed at the Presidio. And is there any reference to that in the um, letters that the correspondence? I need to read the book. That's the um, the question that Karen um, and I have been have been in touch about. There's nothing that I've been able to find that shows the exact building um, that he was in, and I doubt you've probably been able to figure that out, have you? Uh, no, we, um, we, it looks like we have to go to the Fourth Army records. So when General DeWitt uh, was in the Presidio, who was responsible in, in helping to issue these exclusion orders and persuading President Roosevelt to issue Executive Order 9066, um, they, we've, we've been working with the National Park Service and they said probably the records are with the Fourth Army records, which means the Army, because they're not at the Presidio, that's mostly architectural. But we're, we're working with them to, to find out because there were several, there was one prison and actually Roz and I, the, the uh, historian from the National Park Service took Roz and I up to it. It's all boarded up uh, at the top of Austin. And, uh, but there were several stockades, so we, we still don't know yet. But that's why I moved our, our offices, the, the Cor Fred Cormont Institute offices, over to Presidio because how ironic is that? <laughs> we can, we'll, we'll find that. We'll find it soon. Um, but it's very ironic. I want to thank everybody for uh, coming, and we can just conclude here. Thank you for coming. And uh, the procedure, if you'd like to purchase the Burks, you can purchase them over here. We will give you uh, three hours of free parking. <laughs> and then um, stay for their uh, light reception here, and you can meet the author. We have little inscription cards. You can write that to people, your loved ones, or uh, multiple people that you want to get the book to, and you come up here, and uh, Lori can sign the books. Okay. Well, thank you for coming. There's Manju. Thank you for Dale. And Manju and some wine and some uh, refreshments. Blueberry. <laughs> Blueberry Manju for those wine. Thank you.